New York is a bit like being in an abusive relationship. Emotionally abusive, not physically. What happens in an emotionally abusive relationship? That person starts to make you feel that without them, you're nothing. New York in particular, I think San Francisco can do this, can have very much a spell that it casts. And it feels that if you're not there, you're not relevant and you can't possibly be successful outside of, of, of that cocoon. One thing I began to realize was that I was feeling a sense of accomplishment just for living in the city. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. It's almost the reverse. It's not even that you you aren't accomplishing. You're taking steps backwards. Things just got so bad with my health and so bad with our lifestyle that we just hit a office space moment. For anybody who's seen office space, oh, yeah. I just hit a moment where I didn't care anymore. And I started doing irresponsible things. Like um, what? <laughs> The place you choose to live can have an outsized influence on how you choose to live. If where you live is a bad influence on you, you'll do things that aren't good for you. If where you live is a good influence on you, you'll do things that are good for you. The place you live can influence you through cost of living, through weather, through how you get around, even through culture. If people in a place value one thing, it can make it hard for you to be honest with your values for another thing. So if you're going to love your work, you need to design your surroundings so you can pursue the values that are important to you. One way to do that is by designing your life. One way to do that is by choosing the right place to live. The influence of a place has long been an interesting topic for me because... I have long felt like I was born in the wrong place. It wasn't until after college, after I had traveled a small amount, that this feeling really hit me. Because Nebraska, for many people, is synonymous with the middle of nowhere. For me, until then, it was simply where I lived. So as I struggled to find work after college and to set up a life somewhere that matched my values, that was when I really started to feel profoundly unlucky for being born and raised in the middle of nowhere. As an aspiring designer, the design scene in Nebraska was non-existent pretty much. I wanted to live in a cosmopolitan city such as San Francisco or Seattle. Even Minneapolis was a bustling metropolis in my mind. Yet I still felt stuck because of family ties, a lack of social connections in those other places, and simply because I was afraid of change. And now I've lived in some big cities. I've lived in the Bay Area. I spent a couple months in the NYC area over the course of a couple different mini lives. I lived for eight years in Chicago. And now I know that much of the fear that I felt for leaving the middle of nowhere was cultivated by the mindset of the people who lived there. When I finally did leave Nebraska for California, it did not really calm my nerves very much to hear all the fear-laden objections of the people around me. They'd say, the traffic is horrible. You'll never buy a house. Or the people are different. To which I thought, yeah, that's kind of the idea. Anyway, same thing. When I moved from San Francisco to Chicago, I remember one guy said, I couldn't believe this. What's in Chicago besides a bunch of big buildings? Uh, you run a Ruby on Rails dev shop, genius? That technology was invented by a Chicago company. It took me many years of living many places to recognize how no matter where you live, you can get swept up in the concerns that prevail the culture the culture around you. Those big cosmopolitan places where I was desperate to live were no exception. Which brings us to the topic today of lifestyle design. How to leave New York, so to speak, or really any place that's a bad influence on your behavior that doesn't help you build the life that's consistent with your values. Demir and Carrie Bentley are co-founders of Lifehack Bootcamp, where they help professionals make more of their time and energy to get more results, and they too found themselves getting sucked into the prevailing values of the place they lived. They were living in NYC, they were working tons of hours, and they were 
paying the price for it big time with their failing health. So now they live right around the corner from me in Medellin, Colombia. That is when they aren't traveling the world. So I joined them in their home just a few days after having their very first child. They were still available and had the energy and time to sit down and talk to me because of this amazing life that they've built. And you'll hear more about that. So we talked about how they escaped the toxic mental distortions of the NYC lifestyle, how they traveled the world, and then how they designed this new, better balanced life in another country. So in this conversation, you'll learn, Demir says he started doing irresponsible things when he finally hit his office space moment. So what did he do that would have certainly gotten him fired? It's a funny story, but there's also a lesson about lifestyle design in there too. What's the champagne moment exercise? If you have a vision of a better life, but don't know where to start, learn a mental hack that you can apply this week to make progress toward that vision. And are you looking for the next travel destination and wondering whether you can still get some work done? Learn about the Pilates test. What does Pilates have to do with finding reliable Wi-Fi? Here's Demir and Carrie Bentley. So I'm here with Demir and Carrie Bentley, and I'm surprised to be here because they had a baby. Well, I guess Carrie had a baby. How long ago? <laughs> Six days ago. Don't take this away from me. I was involved into it. Well, yes. He was there the whole time. <laughs> Obviously. It's an amazing time for you right now because I th- think that you've been trying to set this up for a while. Because if we're in Medellin right now, we're in your beautiful apartment, newly remodeled. And there is a baby in the other room that you just had, and you are free and available to have a podcast conversation. So can we go back to your life in New York and how did you, I guess throughout the course of this conversation, we'll we'll figure out how did you get from there to here? What was your life like in New York? Yeah. So, I mean, it's actually worth taking a half a second and just asking how I got to New York. Because I think most people who've lived in New York at some point will sort of recognize the the, the draw of, of cutting your teeth in New York City. The idea that if you were the 4.1 GPA high school student or if you went to a good school uh, before the 2008 crash, there was this real lure to being an investment banker. It was really like... If you don't know what to do, but you're really dang smart, then you should go be an investment banker. And then afterwards, you'll be able to do anything else. There was respect. I think we don't remember this, that there was quite a bit of respect lended to investment banking before that industry basically destroyed the global economy. And I I was pulled in by that lure. I had done some things before that weren't weren't really worth mentioning in this context. And I I went to New York and got a job in banking and um, was actually privileged to see the whole ride down. So my experience in finance was that I got in at the top and broke it all the way down. And at the time, people were just desperate for a job. This is something you'd really only know if you were in the finance industry or in New York. I mean, you had people with tremendous, like decades of experience, PhDs coming, looking for entry-level work because, you know, the the whole industry shrunk, shrunk up to 25% of the size that it had been before. And it still really hasn't grown back. So a lot of people were out of a job. And for those of us who kept our job, the pressure was tremendous to work 80, 90, 100 hours because there was this feeling that there was a line around the block of people who would gladly take your job, who we all knew were more qualified than you for your job. So, you know, me, my life in New York, I was drawn to it through this, you know, desire to become one of these investment banking, highly respected people and got very pulled into this sort of just bone crushing you know, like gallbladder exploding, like work hours. Yeah. And I wasn't in banking, but I was in uh, a pretty just aggressive industry that emphasized working a lot of hours and really just sacrificing everything about yourself, your personal time, your health, your relationship with your family, just anything because the job always came first. And I think it's it's really interesting that you brought up the, the global economy crash, because I think if it had been a different period, we might have stayed in New York mm. and we might have kept going on that track. 
But because of everything happening, we started to not understand what was so rewarding about it. Why were we sacrificing so much? And we both ended up with uh, chronic health conditions brought on by stress. <laughs> One of those conditions that doctors can't explain why it happens, mm -hmm. autoimmune disorders, but they happen to about a third of people in developed countries, at least, and brought on by stress and just pure overworking. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I always used to read the newspapers and there'd be like an odd headline every year. It's like, you know, man dies from working too much in Japan. And I would always say, okay, how do you really die from working too much? And I actually know now how you do because it's what happened to me. What happens is you're sitting down for 10, 12 hours a day, right? And then you get on the subway and you sit down more and then you go home and you go to sleep. And so do that for five years and your body just starts to say, oh, we're dying now. That's what's happening. That combined with a tremendous amount of cortisol coursing through your system mm -hmm. and that signals to your body that you are constantly in fight or flight mode. And so you develop these illnesses that otherwise you just wouldn't have. Yeah. So my doctor basically said, what's happening is your, your immune system is shutting down. Your stomach, your digestion is shutting down. That was the worst thing is my body just stopped moving food through it. Mm. Just, I started getting really weird symptoms of just, oh, your body's just not digesting food anymore. Just sort of like the whole machine that moves food through your body has stopped. So without getting to TMI, let's just say that we arrived at a place where I got an ultimatum on my health. And the ultimatum was you have to stop working anything more than 40 hours a week. And when you're working in finance, I won't say that I was working 100 hours every week. No, I, I, I never worked less than 65, 70 hours a week. And sometimes I would stay, you know, through the weekends or at nights, you know, I've had the odd staying overnights. So, you know, the, the sort of, you know, copy and paste the hellish stories that you hear from other people in finance. And uh, I just turned to Carrie. And I remember when we had this like sort of moment of, we can't do this anymore. And so what the hell else are we going to do? I mean, I'm a highly trained monkey effectively, right? I, I can only do my job in New York city, right? I won't get into the details of it, but I was a, you know, a data forensics analyst who sold, who collected data and sold it into Wall Street hedge funds. You can't do that in Durango. You can't do that in Miami, right? I mean, you need to live in New York City and you need to play by those New York City rules. And so it didn't just feel like I have to leave New York City. It felt like I had to leave finance. I had to leave New York City. And to leave New York City felt that I was a loser, Mm -hmm. Right. I'd been on TV. I'd been featured and things that I felt were important and that inflated my ego. And it, it just very much felt like only losers leave New York City. That's that's the way you feel when you're in New York City. Yeah, I think that's the key thing is when we had that aha moment, I guess what we really came to realize was that we were putting other people's opinion about us first. And that was sort of an ego thing. Because that's what the career ladder is, is you're worrying about what other people think about you. You're worrying about how much money you're making, what's the latest car you're driving, all of that stuff. And you're not really focusing on what's really important, which are things like your health, your happiness every single day. And that is not contingent on what other people think about you unless you let it, in which case then you're always going to be dependent on that. And so we really had to make a choice. Do we want to keep doing that, which is a completely viable thing to do? And many people do it. Or do we want to make a different decision and face the consequences of that and face the judgment mm -hmm. of our friends and family? Like Damir was saying, like a lot of the people we knew looked at us like, wow, you guys have fallen. We know once we, once we decided to move and um, we'll, we'll share about our journey there, but you know, basically, oh, poor Damir and Carrie. How far they must have fallen. I remember fast forward a little bit. We were living in New York city and I was trying to get back on my feet. We, I wasn't working in finance anymore. I was finding something new to do. And we were Airbnb some, some rooms in our house for some extra income. And uh, we were living a pretty nice life. I and mean, we were living in Marina del Rey. I mean, it was nobody should pity us, but a friend from New York came to visit us. And at that point, as we were having dinner, an Airbnb guest came in, we welcomed them. We said, Oh, your room's upstairs. Have a great stay, blah, blah, blah. And then I turned around and I saw the faces of my friends from New York. And you could see just written all over their faces, just like, oh, how sad. How sad that Demir has fallen this far. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's the truth is we started making decisions that really benefited us personally. And that was really putting ourselves first, our lifestyle first. It meant doing things like 
creating a business where we could work together and therefore manage our own stress levels and not have it dependent on our bosses or our jobs. Therefore, we could be healthy. We could start traveling around the world together. We could actually save a lot more money than we were saving when we lived in New York and Los Angeles. So it it did mean making radically different decisions, though, which I think people try to ask us how we did it. And they don't sometimes understand that there's also sacrifices like that that we were willing to make. Yeah, Airbnb in your house is not something everyone wants to do. But for us, it was a no brainer because it was just such good money at a time when we didn't, we wanted to get out of our jobs and you need more money at that yeah. time. Yeah. So, but let's talk a little bit more about this, this idea of feeling like a loser. Mm-hmm. This, you know, because whether it's LA or New York, I've spent a month in New York a couple times. And usually like within two weeks, I start having an existential crisis <laughs> and thinking that I'm a loser. And, and then I, then I start to realize that I, I'm, I don't know what, what, what exactly is going on. You've spent more time there than, than I have, but something is changing my own self-perception in a way. So you can't just undo that, right? Well, my way of thinking about New York now is that New York is a bit like being in an abusive relationship, right? Emotionally abusive, not physically, right? What happens in an emotionally abusive relationship? That person starts to make you feel that without them, you're nothing, Mm-hmm. Without me, nobody else is going to want you. You're no good out there without me. And that's very much how New York starts to make you feel. Like, like it, you can't be truly successful outside of New York. That's how I felt, at least. And I've said this to other people in New York, and they just, I get those aggressive head nods. They and agree with you. They, oh, they, they just, they get it. And, and even that moment when people from New York will come and visit us here in Medellin and see this beautiful life that we're living here in Medellin, Colombia. And we're only four and a half, five hours away from New York. So it's not like we're, I think they think that we're in South America, like, like in Bolivia, you know, that, that we're like 18 hours away. And you see these lights come on and you see them fall out of the spell of New York City mm-hmm. and, and they don't want to go back. And then they go back and then they're back in, right? And so New York in particular, I think San Francisco can do this, can have very much a spell that it casts. And it feels that if you're not there, you're not relevant and you're not doing important work and you can't possibly be successful outside of, of, of that cocoon. Yeah. And it becomes the, this sort of, there's nothing else that exists kind of feeling like, oh, this is the set. I, I mean, I lived in San Francisco for a year. I was one of these people who thought that you know, nothing outside of San Francisco exists for the, like the 18 months or so that I was living there. And, and I began to, one thing I began to realize was that I was feeling a sense of accomplishment just for living in the city. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's interesting. That's so true. That's so true. You experience it, anything like that? It's almost the reverse. It's not even that you, you aren't accomplishing, you are usually, at least we were, we were taking steps backwards because those cities tend to be so expensive to live in and they work you so hard that you're basically, you're degrading your health, you're degrading your savings account. And there's, there's not a lot of ways that those people, like for us, we could never have bought a house in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't in the cards. So certainly not in New York. And so if we had submitted ourselves to that and said, well, we have to be in New York though, then I mean, I don't know, like I don't, we wouldn't have been able to have a child for sure. You know, we wouldn't have been able to have our own business or I mean, the I don't wanna, we want to I don't want to exaggerate it. Maybe we would have figured something out. I mean, many people are figuring out how to live in New York and how to live in San Francisco. I just want to sort of stay, take a step back and just raise my hand and say, if something hadn't gone terribly wrong, I would still be there. Like, I don't want to claim that I had a spiritual or intellectual like sort of rebirth. Mm-hmm. The truth is, is that things just got so bad with my health and so bad with our lifestyle that we just hit what what I can only call a office space moment for anybody who's seen office space. Oh, yeah. I just hit a moment where I didn't care anymore. And I started doing irresponsible things. Like um, what? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, you I'm, have to I'm, I'm, up I'm mildly, when I say mildly, I mean, very mildly famous for having outsourced my job. So I had an important, you know, $250,000 a year finance job. And I just got to a point where I didn't care anymore. And I hired three guys in India and they did 
pretty much 95% of the work that I was doing. And that was absolutely against company, company policy, right? I would have absolutely gotten fired if anybody found out or litigated potentially. I mean, and that was a very serious, like... Is yeah. this okay for me to publish this? <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay. It's okay. I've told this story so many times that this is not the first time this story is being disclosed. And, and at, at the end of the day, there was no true wrongdoing. I mean, the truth was we, we did great work. We submitted to the client. There was no stealing. There was no theft. It just, I did it in a way that was definitely against company policy. But, but you didn't care. And that's kind of what pushed you. It was, if you've seen the movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm not talking to you because I know you've seen the movie. <laughs> but if, if, if one has seen the movie, you sort of see a picture of somebody who, whose life can't get any worse. And so it finally starts getting better. And I think when I finally, I needed that. I needed that health crisis. I needed that crisis of conscience. I needed to stop caring. I needed to hit rock, rock bottom. And I needed to take some big chances. And I think you had sort of said, hey, when we come over, let's talk about how you guys got out of your old life, quote unquote, New York, and got into a new life. And a big part of that, and I've seen it time and again, when we work with our clients on redesigning their life, there's always a moment where you do all the right things, you stack, you build, you plan. There's always a moment where you need to take a risk. Yep. Almost always a moment where you need to jump. Yeah. And I'm remembering my moment right at this time, because I don't think I would have been able to do it without Demir. He's just, he gives off this energy, like he believes in you and he knows he can see the vision for the future that you just can't see for yourself. And because I was one of those people that was like, okay, I get that that could be really cool to start our own business or start traveling around the world, but let's get logical here. That's never going to happen for me. And I'm more of that sort of person. And Demir was the one who really convinced me to take a stand for myself at my job. And I had this moment when we were on vacation in Colorado, where I decided that the next day when I got back into the office, I was actually going to ask for what I wanted, which was to start working from home and work uh, part-time and be able to uh, actually get a, get a raise at the same time. And I just felt so nervous about doing that. I think I'm getting some adrenaline just thinking about how nervous I was. But without that sort of push and that that pressure to for, for, from, from him just to ask, because people don't ask for so what they actually did you do want. It? Yeah, of course. I did it. I did it. I walked into the office the next day because I knew Demir was going to ask me what had happened when I got home. And I asked for what I wanted and I got everything that I asked for. And can I interject in the story to say that what was the most stress inducing was that she had them over a barrel and she knew it, right? She, she had them in a situation where they're understaffed at her particular level. And so that if she left, she would basically tank an entire launch of a product. Mm -hmm. And I said, use that. I said, go in there and fuck them, use that. And she's not just like every normal, decent human being in the world. She's not like that. <laughs> and, and I was like, you, I was like, you are going to wait until they get another person hired in your role. And then you're going to ask, and they're going to say, no, I was like, ask now when you have leverage. And so I just wanted to add to that story, a missing piece that's really important it is, is that important. what really happened isn't just that she asked, what happened is that she knew she had leverage and she used it. And but for, for everyone I've spoken with who has a similar story and finally took the risk and made the leap, they always just say they wish they had done it earlier. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, leverage is really important. And if you have it, I think you should take it. But I'm the same way. I'm like, I wish I had done that six months earlier or a year earlier, because then I would have gotten everything I wanted then. And I wouldn't yeah. have had to suffer for longer. You make it sound so simple right now, though, that it was this thing that you were afraid of and you just walked in and did, did it. Like how? You just have to, I mean... I don't, I don't remember a thing that I said. I just remember saying like, I'm not going to sit down on my desk. I'm going to walk into the office. I'm going to go directly into the conference room where we have a pre-scheduled meeting with my boss. And I am going to say these things. And I had just rehearsed them in advance. And I had, had just figured out what, it, what I was going to say exactly. And I just asked for what I wanted. And then I just stopped talking. What did you say exactly? Oh my gosh. I was... It was a while ago, so I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember the exact words. Um, but essentially what I, what I did was I explained, Hey, my dad is really sick right now. And he was at that time incredibly sick. And I said, I need to be able to take more time away from work to visit him. And so here's what I'm requesting. I'm requesting to 
take a, a step back and become a consultant for the company instead of a full-time employee. And with that, I'm asking to be able to work from wherever I choose to work, which may be sometime in the office, but majority will be from different locations. And we can, and this would be my hourly rate, which essentially as a consultant gives me a massive raise because I have full control over my uh, health benefits and all of that sort of thing. And I can deduct expenses against it. So that's what I asked for. Most people would probably get that calculation wrong though, right? I'm just, I mean, yep. this is kind of beside the point, but going from full-time employee to, to consultant, you need to like double your rate or something, don't you? I mean, no. So gosh, I forget how the math actually works out, but basically think about this, think about it this way. As an employee, you are forced to, to buy into say like the company health policy, uh, social security, you get taxed at actually a very high rate as an employee versus as a contractor, you are basically a small business owner. So you can start deducting your work-related expenses, like your office space and your home and your internet and your phone bill and all that sort of stuff, your gas mileage. And so what you're being taxed on isn't your gross income, it's your net income. So basically you're taking your taxable income down, which drastically decreases your, your tax. And usually in case in my case, it also bumped me down to a lower tax bracket. Mm-hmm. And that's where the real savings came in for me. I think an important thing to emphasize here is it's important to recognize getting in good trouble from getting in bad trouble, right? There's these feelings we have. Like if I walk over to that girl at that bar, something terrible is going to happen. I don't know what it is. And if you pressed me to say what would happen, I can't quite enunciate it, but I know that I'm terrified of it. And I know it would be terrible. And I think that's really your limbic system, your lizard brain is talking and and just, you know, your prefrontal cortex is taking the ride. But then there's things that are actually truly dangerous. Like let me, you know, go at five o'clock at night into a really dangerous part of town and walk alone in a dark street. That's actually really dangerous. And the problem is it feels the same. And sometimes things that aren't really presenting you any danger actually feel tremendously dangerous, mm-hmm. right? And so I just boil that down into sometimes the things trouble. that that are that are tremendously dangerous don't feel dangerous. Yeah, they actually feel true. pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> right? totally. So you know what's funny is I just boil that down into telling you know my clients and my you know the community that we're, we coach. I just say make sure that you can tell the difference between good trouble and bad trouble. It's good to get in some good trouble. What's going to happen if you walk into your boss and you ask for what you want? Are they really going to say how dare you? You're fired. I mean, one out of a thousand scenarios, yes. But most of the time, well, the worst that could happen is that they're going to say no. Mm -hmm. And you go back to your desk and you're no worse off than you were before. Maybe a little bit bolder, maybe a little bit more practice with asking for what you want. And I'm surprised, I'm constantly surprised when people will come back to me and and say, oh, oh my God, you know, the girl that I wanted to date, she actually went on a date with me or the, the my boss actually gave me something. So, you know, that's the, that's the cleavage that I like to draw. It's like, make sure that, you know, Carrie felt that that wasn't possible, but there was no true consequence right. behind it. Whereas I was actually getting in real trouble. <laughs> I was actually doing something that could get me really in trouble. What I like about the way Carrie approached it was that she said that she had rehearsed everything, right? Yeah. And so this is one of these things that I know that when I first did started doing public speaking, it was terrifying and still is kind of terrifying. <laughs> But, you know, I went into my first couple of speeches so prepared that, like, there was no possible way that I could fail. Exactly. And so that helped the nervous system a little bit. Were there any, are there any other ways that you talk to your clients about this, this way of being able to distinguish or prepare yourself for these situations that seem really, that feel dangerous, but that aren't? I like to be pretty pragmatic about it. Being pragmatic the first couple of times are going to feel pretty scary. Just like the first couple of times of any scary thing, jumping off a cliff, you know, jumping out of a plane. Just remember, why do people keep doing it over and over again? Because it starts to feel really good. That's why people keep doing it, right? And I like to think that I'm a gambler. I, I, I gamble on myself. I get in scary, risky situations. When I say risky, I mean good trouble. I like to get myself in good trouble where there's no real consequence or fallout. Nothing will... I won't die. You know, nothing bad will happen. I might lose a couple bucks, but I'm I'm constantly getting myself and carry by extension into 
good trouble. We're out in front of our skis. We don't really know what we're doing. We're so trying something new. Asymmetric opportunities, right? It's like very low downside, high potential upside, perhaps a low chance of upside, but... But also it's certainly a zero, a zero risk. Also, basically eliminating the risk is the name of the game, mm-hmm. and because, like Demir said, asking for something from your boss, they can just say no. There's, there's practically, I would say, there's zero risk to that. People think that they're going to get fired, the and same and way. so then if they do think they're going to get fired, and they need something to fall back on so that they can still ask for what they want, then it's about creating a plan in but, advance. But we are missing the most important thing, which is that we know in our heart of hearts, and we've seen it with other people, that people who consistently get in good trouble, maybe not the first or second or third time, but they will end up actually doing something, pulling it off, mm-hmm. right? Somebody does not know how to write a book or be an author, and all of a sudden they write enough, and all of a sudden something hits. They got a big blog. They got a they got a book that hit, right? Uh, somebody doesn't really know how to run a business. All of a sudden they're making money. And- that's when the endorphins get, and that's when the, yeah. the high hits. When you think about somebody placing a bet and then you see your, your horse runs around the track and, and, and it wins and you get that high. And you can get that in real life by, by taking a bet on yourself and you feel that tremendous fear and that your stomach is shrinking and your, your heart is sinking and then you pull it off. And I think it's important not to underestimate how high you get in that moment. And that what happens very shortly after is that you say, I want more. Yeah. And like when you do that, that first time that you say, put that book out there or get up on a stage and do a speech, there's a transformation that happens too. It's like you're crossing a threshold and suddenly you're able to do it. So yeah, it's like you've leveled up your confidence and it's permanently now at that new level because you've broken through to that, that new level of gameplay. Yeah. So when you had that conversation with your boss, did that, suddenly open up your eyes to other possibilities or was that just a, an over no. an overnight transformation? It was definitely sort of open eye opening. And I was like, okay, this is just the beginning. <laughs> Cause once you, w- once you have it in the bag, you're like, oh, of course I did that. Of course that happened. And, and you, you forget, you forget very quickly what it felt like, how nervous it made you. But then it's true. It does make you realize that you can keep doing that. And it also made me trust in what Demir's crazy ideas were a little bit more too, because he had that trust and credibility with me. So when he started talking about, hey, we just start a business together and we should start traveling around the world together, instead of immediately dismissing it as that's crazy and that would never work and that would be way too expensive to do that, I at least took the time to sit down and work out the numbers yeah. and, and figure it out and realize that, yeah, there was actually a way we could start doing that. So after this conversation, what next? So I, I want to be clear. We're, we're fussing with the timeline a little bit. Yeah. So, and, and, and I think the most important thing for people to remember is there wasn't a moment where I had like a sort of office space moment and then I quit the next day and we bought a plane ticket. You know, this really was a probably what, two or three, three years, I'm, my yeah. timelines are bad. Well, so I'm asking. Not in a timeline way, but in an emotional way of, of having that first conversation recognizing that this is possible to do these things. Was there a next thing that you did that would have been scary to you before? Oh, totally. So the next thing we did was we made the transition for me into entrepreneurship. Demir had already started his own company and we, we won't get into that much. So he was more used to it. But for me, the idea of being an entrepreneur was incredibly scary and not something that I was ever particularly interested in, to be honest. But I saw it as the easiest way that we could get where we wanted in terms of our lifestyle freedom. So that was sort of the biggest moment because it in, versus just asking for what I wanted in my job, this was going to actually require my personal self-identity to change and for me to start working in a completely different way. So that was really scary. And also, I didn't particularly have that much respect for entrepreneurs because the ones I had met, I did not love their lifestyle so the way we wanted to do it was going to be a little bit different. And I was just nervous about, you know, if we were going to be able to pull that off and what that was going to look like. I think it's important to mention that Carrie worked for a very tiny company previously called Craft, Food, Craft Foods International. And the brand that she worked on was a very small billion dollar business called Oscar Meyer Bologna. So she was a superstar in her, her track. 
And she was uh, extremely young and being promoted extremely aggressively. So that's important to throw out there for people to know that for her to to let go of that, wow. to jump off that track, yeah, felt significant. It, it felt like she was she was valued there, she was promoted there, and so and she was on a track there. And so it's more than just oh, let's travel the world. She really did have to let go of that. I'm going to be the next CEO of Kraft. Yeah, identity. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, that, and that's a key word here is identity and making that shift, especially when you live in a city that you identify with, like that's part of your self-concept is that you are accomplished and now you live in New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco and you get that, that's part of your identity. So how do you make that identity shift? Well, for me, it was recognizing that if I let my identity identity be predicated on accomplishments or what people say about me or my job title, then I wasn't ever going to truly be happy because my self-worth isn't something that can be given to me or something that I need to earn every day. It's just something I have. So whether I'm homeless walking around on the streets or I'm a big time CEO somewhere, my actual self-worth remains complete and whole. And so for me, it was really recognizing that. That's something that you have to- Yeah, how do you- You have to to choose that every day. No, that's not a flip the switch sort of transformation. No. I think that that required a lot of personal self-development work that Demir and I did do and have continued to do because that's just so important to recognize that when when you let yourself get tied up in those sort of more egotistical things, then you start to get in that compare and despair sort of- trap and you let things start to mean things that they just don't have to mean. Carrie's journey was very mature. Mine, less so. (laughs) I'm an insecure overachiever, right? And I love that term. I forget the author who came up with that, but just fantastic term. It perfectly describes me, which means that people didn't have to get on top of me at work to hit deadlines. I mean, I was constantly paranoid about what people thought about me. I was constantly disciplining myself internally, constantly trying to be seen as worthy in the eyes of, of the people around me. And, and corporations love insecure overachievers. They are the best employees. I mean, yeah. they are just fantastic. They will, they will internally torture themselves. So then you just have to start setting boundaries, right? You have to start doing things with the knowledge that this other person might not think this is okay, but I'm doing it anyway. I mean, the way that I experienced it was very more like an office space moment. It's more like I just came out of the spell. You just don't care. Like like I just, I just came out of the spell and it dangerously. So very much like an office, office space. I came out of the spell and bounced the other way and just didn't care. I didn't care if I was fired. I didn't care. Little context. My natural mother lives in Hawaii and has always been saying, Hey, come back to Hawaii. We love you in Hawaii. And so I I just started thinking a lot like, well, wouldn't it be better to be a loser in Hawaii than to live like this? You know, I started thinking crazy thoughts about quitting my job, getting fired from my job. I started taking uh, irresponsible risks. It turns out for me, and in my case, those risks paid off, but they just as easily couldn't have. They just as easily could have resulted in me being sent packing, you know, without a job. But as it turns out, you know, it resulted in me outsourcing my job and working two hours a week. But what I love about Demir's story is also that it illustrates how you can't actually have it both ways. And this is something we encounter with our clients a lot, where they're trying to design a different sort of lifestyle, but then they feel like they still have to meet their existing job requirements or fulfill on their boss's demands in the exact same way that they always did. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, like you were saying, David, there comes a moment where you have to reset your priorities and you have to ask yourself, well, what truly is more important? Is it my new lifestyle that I'm trying to create for myself and taking these actions that benefit me? Or is it how I've been living in the, in the past? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times that's the switch that needs to be made. It's just that reprioritization. We're going to take a quick break. If you're having trouble hiring the best talent for your business, it's probably because the best talent already has a job. The best talent is never looking for a job. So how do you get your job host in front of the best talent if they're not looking? You go somewhere, they're already spending time. You know that LinkedIn is a hot social platform for professionals. You heard Robbie Yved talking about it a few episodes ago. 
So what if you could get your job openings in front of the best professionals, the ones who are already spending time on LinkedIn? You can do exactly that with LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn has the deepest, most up-to-date, most insightful data set on professionals. They use that data to match your job opening to qualified professionals. Many of them aren't even actively looking for a new job because they have great jobs because they're top talent. LinkedIn will promote your job opening across their platform. They will target the professionals who are the best fit for that job. I think it's brilliant because the best talent isn't actively looking for a job, yet LinkedIn is still able to reach them. So it's no wonder that a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash loveyourwork. Again, that's linkedin.com slash love your work to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. Is there a little exercise that our listeners could do for that that would at least get them started on making that comparison? Yeah. One, one exercise that we have our clients do a lot is something called the champagne moment exercise. So basically we ask them, What's one thing that you could do this week that would provide you with some sort of leverage, meaning that it makes other things, other goals that you have even easier to achieve. Mm. So it's not just a priority in, in the sense that it's the most important thing to do. It's actually leveraged, meaning that it makes future priorities even easier to accomplish. And so once they've identified that and say it's a, it's a personal goal of theirs, what's a good example? Yeah. What's something somebody has done? I mean, you know, because let's say that you, that you wanted to start a side business that you could then leverage to get out of New York, for example, yeah. right? Are you doing something every single week, whether big or small, that is moving you in a substantive way towards that goal? Yeah. And not just a one-time task, but a, the kind of thing where you're laying down infrastructure that you can stand on top of next week. I can think of even, you know, before I, way before I moved to Columbia, way before I did any mini lives in other places... One little action I did was I set up a, a virtual mailbox. Right. Just because I knew that at some point in the future that was going to make things easier. I got a or I got a, you know, a, a bank account mm-hmm. that I knew I would be able to get ATM uh, transactions d- done worldwide without without fees or you know, things like that, just to set it up way ahead of time. You know what I love about that is there's another thing happening there, which is what I call the sort of mental domino fall. Oh. Where you're taking an action and we could argue how relevant that action was to actually moving abroad, but psychologically, it's really relevant. Psychologically, oh, yeah. it starts a domino fall in your brain. That's like, I am moving abroad. I am going to go. Oh yeah. So, especially somebody like me who, who just, I'm, I'm not somebody who takes action really quickly and is decisive in that way. It just certainly opens up that, that, that possibility. So yeah, it's like a mental domino effect. Huh? Totally. I, I like that. And, and then basically what you would do is say that's your champagne moment for the week. Then the goal is to actually get that done as early in the week as possible. So you'd be setting up that virtual mailbox on Monday or Tuesday. And just by thinking of reprioritizing everything in your head, and that becomes the first thing you do on Monday. It's not checking your work inbox. It's not prepping for the big meeting you have on Thursday. It's just setting up your virtual mailbox. That's what helps restructure your brain and gets you focused on what your true priorities are. Yeah, one little thing. And then you drink champagne. And, and then you drink champagne. Yeah. I'll explain the champagne thing <laughs> in a second. But the, the idea is almost like the profit first. So pay yourself first. And so when you're, many people are going to be like we were, they won't be able to snap their fingers and escape their life in New York or San Francisco or wherever they might be. Or maybe it's they're where they want to be, but they're in a job they don't want to be in. They won't be able to snap their fingers. And we didn't either. But every week we took a big action. And so no matter how long you stay stuck, quote unquote, in the life that you don't want to be in, when you know that every single week you're taking big action, leveraged action to create that new life, then you sleep better. You know that, hey, I took a big action this week. Tell me some big actions that you took. So one that I did. And I have to give a huge shout out to Tim Ferriss. As much as everybody does, I got to give a, give a big shout out, mostly because I was such a hater. Before I even cracked his book open, I was like, there's no way you can work four hours a week. I was just 
I'm so pragmatic and blue collar that I almost hated him before I even read the book. Yeah. And, and, but then of course I was led to the book because if there was a way to work four hours a week, then I would certainly want to know about That's that. that title works. Um, and so I read the book and one of the things that he said that really hit me, uh, that's a great first action is he said, you know, I believe this was in the, in his first book. He said, you're not going to try to start outsourcing and using like remote work, like a virtual assistant or, you know, amplifying your work in some way. This is a great way to get um, space. If you can get an assistant who even does 10% of your work, that's 10% more space that you have to do something else. So one of the things he said that I thought was brilliant is he said, take $500 or a hundred, whatever you're willing to take and just burn it. Just say, this $500 will result in nothing for me except learning how to leverage a virtual assistant in another country. That was so profound for me. So I took $500. I, I was making a lot at the time. So 500 didn't feel significant for me. I said, oh, I'm putting $500 on the table and I will not see one penny of this. It's just table stakes to learn how to leverage a virtual assistant. And it took me about two like a month, month and a half of, you know, going back and forth with some projects. And I felt like after a month or a month and a half and, you know, a little bit less than 500, maybe 350 bucks, I was ready. I was already up over the learning curve, yeah. ready to send some work out and get an acceleration on my So you're taking that action. And I think that what I love about that mental trick is that it prevents loss aversion, which is that I can't even spend $10 without knowing what, how I'm going to use it or, or, or if it's going to work. But when you give yourself that permission to take some amount and, and that is being thrown away in some way, or, I mean, I can think of even like the first mini lives I ever went on. It was like, well, you can't spend double rent, which I mean, obviously not everybody can spend double rent, but can you invest a thousand dollars in this potentially life-changing thing to go, if you, and I did, I'm renting my apartment out, but I took the risk that maybe I wouldn't, that I'm going to go rent a place in Buenos Aires and it's going to cost a thousand dollars and I might not see that thousand, but well, you spend that on vacation anyway. So why can't you, right. you know, do a month, exactly. which not everybody can do, but it, it and I think so much about of, of your self-worth is tied into that too. Because something that I encountered and honestly continue to encounter is, well, who am I to have an assistant or who am I to have this work outsourced? It's not that hard. It only takes me a few mm-hmm. minutes to do this. I don't need to spend that money. You know, I can save it instead. And thinking of yourself as someone that is the CEO of their life and is in charge of creating the kind of lifestyle you want and recognizing that there, there are easy ways to create the space for yourself and that that space will be well utilized by you Mm -hmm. to do something even better. So yeah, for me, it's like, it's a constant thing of now that we have so much household help and we have a whole team and we have so many assistants, it's still a a constant (laughs) exercise of asking myself what is on my plate. That's truly uniquely valuable that only I can do versus something that I can get off my plate. And even if it's something I enjoy doing or that's super easy and doesn't take me any time at all, it's always our priority to get that work yeah. delegated out. And that's such a challenging thing mentally. I know I've struggled so much with delegating things and, and asking that question, what can I really only do and, and what, what can I have somebody else help me with? Are there any areas where you ran into any challenges in letting go of certain things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would say the biggest challenge is what you, exactly what you said is the letting go. It's the letting go. It's not actually the doing of something. Right? That's actually remarkably that, easy. It's re- remarkably it's the easy. not doing that's, that's harder. There's, and it's not just one. I would say there's a small booklet of reasons why you tell yourself that nobody can do the work that you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the biggest among them being that it, pr- it provides you with importance if you have to do this work, then you must be important. And valuable. And, and valuable. And, and if anybody off the street can come in and do the work you're doing, what does that mean about how valuable and important you are? And I'll give you an example that was very recent, actually, because I was going to have a baby and I was a CEO of our company and we just could not have me working 
the, the amount, just the sheer amount had to decrease because I wanted to take maternity leave. So we, we, and honestly, I wasn't really enjoying all parts of my job at the same time. It was like, I had this big, important role in the company and that made me feel great. But at the same time, I wasn't waking up every day and saying like, I'm so excited to be doing exactly what I'm doing. And so Demir really sat me down and took a look at my task list. And we figured out basically immediately how to delegate out over half of it. I would say like 70% of a, a the, shamefully large amount. Shamefully <laughs> large, yes. In order also, and then we realized that I, because I was doing all of those lower value tasks, there were actually a lot of high value marketing related tasks that I sort of always wanted to do, but I felt like I didn't have enough time to do because I was taking care of a lot of operations and finance tasks. So with just that one meeting, we made a big decision. We delegated out a lot of my previous roles and Basically, it only took like a week mm-hmm. to, to actually get everything off of my plate. And then I was I was able to shift into a new role the, ne- the week after and that. Was that a challenge in terms of what uh, Demir was just talking about in terms of thinking like, well, if somebody else can do this, how important am I? Absolutely. Yeah. How yeah. do you want to do that? I mean, it, it was. It was me recognizing that that was about me wanting to control and be important and that it actually was holding the business back. Yeah, It wasn't that I was adding so much value and it wasn't that anyone else could do it. I, I, there's a Charlie Rose interview that just blew my mind. It's not recent. You can Google it. It's Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. And uh, Bill Gates is talking about how when he first met Warren Buffett, you know, he was trying to find the time. Like, oh, when do you have time to meet? And let me try to schedule you in. And Warren Buffett just pulled out this like scheduler out of his pocket and he opened it up and flipped through the next seven days and it was completely empty. <laughs> completely empty. And he said that, I'm paraphrasing, that basically Warren had disabused him of the notion that in order to be important, you had to be busy. Mm-hmm. And he introduced him to the notion that that the ultimate importance is ultimate availability. Like no, and, and unreachability, I would add too, although he didn't say that, you know, the, the ultimate luxury today is to not have a cell phone, right? Because you're unreachable, you're open in your schedule, you've got the leisure to think about bigger problems and take, you know, and and take the broader perspective. Yeah. So you've talked about being the the CEO of your life. I like that. Mm -hmm. And here we are in Medellin. And before we began this conversation, you were saying that, you know, we've been trying to set this up for five years. Yeah. What was the vision that you had? How did you arrive there? What did you do to, to get there? And perhaps what, what detours were there? Yeah. The, so the vision we had, we, we were living in, in Los Angeles at the time. And the vision we had for ourselves was we want to put our lifestyle first. And what that looks like for us, and it's different for every person, but for us in particular, we wanted to be able to work a job where we could spend time together. Unfortunately, not working was not an option because we don't, we didn't have anything in terms of savings. In fact, we had a lot of debt that we were working to clear out. Um, but we wanted to work together because we felt like we didn't spend enough time together. We really love hanging out. And we're one of those really odd couples who works well together. So uh, we just knew that we wanted to work together. We were lucky in that way. So we wanted to do that. We also wanted to work uh, from wherever we wanted in the world. That was another stipulation. And we just wanted to have that flexibility because I had been sort of locked down by jobs in the past and felt like be ma- been made to feel like even taking a couple of vacation days was a problem. And I just didn't want to feel like that anymore. And then what was the other, what were some so other things? We also wanted to live a lifestyle where we could focus on, you know, basically building the kind of lifestyle freedom that we wanted. I, I don't personally want to not work. I think a lot of people, their dream is not working, but I also know what it feels like to work 80 hours a week. And so, you know, for us, <laughs> we, a short, a shortcut is we said we have to be able to nap every day from one to 2 PM. Right. And it's a shortcut that basically says, if you can nap every single day, it means that you're not killing yourself. It means you're not working yourself to the bone. Like a, a nap was a symbol. So we just had even some odd things thrown in, right? So we, we had to, I'll just repeat. We had to be able to work from anywhere. We had to be together. We had to work like 35 to 40 hours a week. We had to be able to take a nap every single day. And so we, we, we sort of put these things on the table and sort of created a, imagine if we created two piles, the, the, we can have to have it and can leave it. And so what we, what we were striving to do is 
keep a very small pile of have to have and put everything else on the we can leave it. And so what ended up in the we could leave it pile was where we lived. And we just sort of looked at each other and we said, do you love LA? And you know, no offense to New York or LA, but we looked at each other and we're like, no, I'm not crazy about LA. And so we just sort of said, okay, I mean, if we can move to Kentucky or Mississippi or Mexico or just somewhere else, and we can get everything on this list of have to haves, would we be willing to make that trade? And the answer was absolutely yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. The, the, the leave it list. Yeah. That was definitely a big part of it. I mean, we just stayed focused on, okay, well then how can we get all of those things on our list? And we started, well, really it was Demir, but we started testing different business ideas and trying to find like a viable model that we thought could give us this passive income that everyone was so crazy about. Don't get me started about And passive still income. is. Yeah. So we thought we would be doing a passive income strategy and just over time, over the over the course of about six months, we tested a, a bunch of different ideas. We started our business. We took it through what feels like hundreds of iterations of what the core uh, product was going to be. And then finally, while, while we were still testing it, we realized that we didn't have to wait. We didn't have to wait to start traveling. We didn't have to reach some kind of milestone because we we're already making enough money where we could just leave. This is this is big. I read an article, uh, it's probably in Wired, but I don't remember exactly. And it was about how a founder in New York, or sorry, in San Francisco, had found that it was so expensive to pay his employees the cost of just living in San Francisco that he offered them to take them on a round the world trip and found that it was cheaper to fly his entire team around the world and feed them, clo- put, put them up, airline tickets, It was cheaper than to live in San Francisco. And I brought it to Carrie. And again, as the same reaction we had with the Tim Ferriss for our work week, just like a, no, that's not possible. That's no, mm -mm, that's not possible. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. And the guy had kindly provided all of his numbers. He had actually documented it. And so we went through it and Carrie and I had another sort of aha moment where we said, well, if it's cheaper to travel the world than it is to be in LA, what are we doing in LA? Why don't we start sooner? And I think, and I would share this with anybody, please know that if you're living in a major metropolitan city in the United States, there's a high chance that it's cheaper for you to be traveling the world than it is for you to be in the city that you're in. It's not guaranteed. You have to do the numbers, but um, I'm going to skip a couple steps and say within probably about three months or four months, we found ourselves in Spain working a gig in Spain and and building our company on the side. Then we found ourselves living on a boat in the Mediterranean in Croatia. Um, Parentheses for all you life hackers out there. Most people are like, how can you run your business from a boat in Croatia? The cell phone data speeds in Croatia are insane. We were like a mile offshore, still getting like 20 megabyte down, five megabyte up. So it worked great. We, Mm -hmm. we, and then we landed in Bali and, 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 and thus begun really a period that just ended recently of traveling the world for five years, um, doing geo arbitrage, geo arbitrage for those who don't know is just simply uh, making money in dollars and spending it in a currency where you can buy more. And so we were living in Indonesia where you get good geo arbitrage. We were living in, you know, we went to India, we were, you know, obviously here in, and then we we landed in Latin America in Medellin and uh, I'm happy to pick it up from there. But the point being is that there was this big period When most people will say to themselves, I think this is the important point. Most people say to themselves, I have to grind, sacrifice, and hate my life as I build my business. That's how it has to be. And then once the business is successful, then I can travel. And we found it to be just the opposite. That traveling abroad lowered our cost of living to the point that actually made it possible for us to have the runway to make the business work. Right. And we actually, that was the first time we really started saving money and putting money away. At the same time, we were living this sort of vacation style lifestyle and we just couldn't believe it. We're like, this is too good to be true. And we, let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing more. Let's see how far we can push this. And that's how we found ourselves in, in Medellin. And we decided to buy an apartment here and start a family. Before we get into the, the Medellin and the wonderful life that you set up, I want to hear, are there, were there moments where you, you thought, this is not what I bargained for as you're traveling around the world. That We had surprisingly few 
like, I hate this moments. Yeah. So surprisingly few, I hate these people. I hate this culture. I hate this situation moments. So it would be very deceptive to tell you, uh, I'm going to tell you a story, but I want to disclaimer that story by saying it is literally the only story out of five years of traveling. I only have one story I can think of where we were just hating it. And that was when we went to Nicaragua. Right. Yeah, she's she's nodding her I head. I just remembered that. I was, I was <laughs> trying to figure out, out what the story was. <laughs> she had blocked but that it out. In part, that was just, I think, wrong place, wrong wrong matchup of, of people to place. Nicaragua was just not our cup of tea. Let's just put it this way. When you're running an online business, there's no anxiety like internet anxiety. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. no anxiety like not being able to reach your platform, Gmail, your clients, your documents. It, 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 somebody who doesn't work abroad won't realize it, but there's no fear. I would rather live in a one quarter size apartment and have a good internet connection working abroad than, than, than jeopardize my internet. And we went to Nicaragua and all of a sudden the internet was out. We went to the guy at the cafe we walked to the guy and we said, Hey, you know, the internet's out. He's like, yeah, it's going to be like that. I said, Oh, so we should just leave the cafe. He's like, no, the whole city it's out. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, they're fixing uh, the lines between us and the capital. And so there's just not going to be any internet in the city for uh, about seven days. <laughs> we, were, we just laughed. We just couldn't But you know what's, what's ironic about that is people always think, oh, well, you know, that's because you're in a third world country. Of course, that's the case. Well, guess what happened in California just recently? A lot of people left without power yeah, and blackouts. therefore their yeah. internet as well. And so it's just interesting for us now sort of seeing it from a different perspective yeah. that that sort of thing can happen anywhere. But it's funny that, please notice in that story that it wasn't that we didn't like Nicaraguans and it wasn't that we didn't like Nicaragua as a country. It's that there are certain cities that have globalized to a point where you can live the life that you need and, and work remotely from it. And there are still cities where you cannot do that or, or trying to do it would just be tremendously hard. Yeah. And here, here's my hack. For anybody who wants to look at Google Maps and immediately determine whether that city would be a good city oh. to work from. You don't even have to visit. I can tell you. It's called the Pilates test. The Pilates <laughs> test. If you search a city on Google Maps and you search it for Pilates and there are more than three Pilates studios in that city, then I can virtually guarantee you it's going to have great cafes. It's going to have great internet. It's going to have great walkability. Why? Because only rich fufu people take Pilates. Three Pilates studios. Do you know how many there Pilates studios there are in Medellin? I have no idea. Upwards a of a hundred. A lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that the internet thing has happened in Medellin. It's, it hasn't happened for a while, but for like you know a day or half a day, where it's just like oh, on my cell phone and through. My Wi-Fi, there's no internet and at the cafe, just a little bit, not seven days. That's different. This is a thing that people ask me all the time. And I don't know so I, if I have a great answer, but I wonder what your answer is. Why Medellin? Yeah. I mean, Medellin hit a lot of the items on our sort of like wish list, so to speak. So a, a sort of a digital nomad or, you know, a traveler's wish list looks a lot different, I think, than a lot of people's. But for us, a really high priority was we wanted to be on the same time zone as our clients. Just makes running our business a lot easier. And Medellin happens to be either on central time or Eastern time the whole year. So super, super simple. Bali, what we loved Bali, Ooh. but just the time zone difference, it's 13 hours. And that was rough. That was super hard rough. to and, run and, a business. And we run a coaching business. So right. that means that we're live with our clients. Mm -hmm. And so that it meant a lot of 4 a.m. wake yes. up calls. Yes. So that was one thing. Another thing was just the, the climate. We really are weather snobs. I grew up in Michigan and you'd think I'd be more accustomed to the cold, but I just cannot stand it. Nebraska kid here. I, yeah. <laughs> right. So <laughs> no Medellin more. is the city of eternal spring. And so that was really nice for us. It was, it's very metropolitan and sort of modern. We like having amenities. We like air conditioning. We like having our little like frappuccinos that we can get at, at you know, cafes. So that for me in particular was just nice, just being able to feel like you're in a really Western city. My sort of general take on this is if you asked me to score Medellin on any one metric, you would probably be able to find a better city in the world for that single metric. So let's just talk about walkability. There's more walkable cities 
in the world, climate, there's even better climate. And this is a great, this is up there, but maybe yeah. there would be something that was even better. But if you created a list of the 36 things that you wanted, internet, climate, food, walkability, proximity to the US, same time zone as your clients, close flights, right? If you created that list and then you scored it for across all of those, although Medellin might not be number one in a ranked choice voting model, if you're nerdy about that, Medellin would be that dark horse candidate that would end up winning the election. Yeah. yeah. And tell us about the life that you have set up here. Oh, gosh. Um, you go for it. Yeah. I, I will say the best way to start is to say that it's so good that it's hard to discuss it with people in the United States. Yeah. Well, let's do it. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm happy to do it because I, I think it's also good to confront people not in a negative way, but in a positive way and say that, hey, even if you don't move to Medellin, if you move out of your state, that I like a positive confrontation that makes people think about how they could change their circumstance and make it better. However, I think probably the best thing about Medellin for me right now as a new parent is the help. You can afford, since we earned money in dollars and we spend it in pesos, we can afford help. And I grew up very blue collar. We never had any house help. We had to clean our own toilets and I, and I was possessed of, I think, a false pride that, oh, I, I do everything for myself. I clean my own toilets. I, I scrub my own, you know, I scrub the, the, the kitchen sink at the end of the night. And as we've been more and more precious about our time together and, and with our baby and, and focused on doing things that really provide value, we've been able to say, no, I'm willing to hire somebody to do that. And so we have a live-in maid here who we pay probably double what what the local currency is. So we feel really good about her and her being able to provide for her family. And we have two cleaners. We have a cleaner that comes in the middle of the week and a cleaner that comes at the end of the week. Now that the baby's come for, we don't know how long we're going to do this, but in the night we have a night nurse and we have a day nanny. So, you know, try to imagine we're five days away from Carrie giving, giving birth. Mm -hmm. And we have the time to, in a very leisurely way, sit down with you and spend the day with you and do a podcast here in our home. Yeah. And yeah, that's and because of help. It's, I, I think for me, the biggest thing is just security. And like Demir said, neither of us come from money. You, you know, we're very much having to provide for ourselves, right? Like most people. And one thing we have here is we're able to completely own our apartment. So we bought it in cash. It is fully paid for. We have zero mortgage payment on it. And it was probably total, what we paid was probably the price of a down payment for a commensurate apartment, actually probably for a much smaller apartment in, in Los Angeles. In fact, that's what we did. We had a down payment fund that we just sort of looked at each other and we said, well, we're not going back anymore. And so we took the down payment for what would have been a house in LA and bought a house outright. Yeah. And, and renovated it at the same time. So for me, it's that security of knowing that no matter what, I have a place that I can be. And the, you know, our, our child is always going to have a home that no one can really take away from us unless there's another, like, I don't know, any, anything can happen if there's like a world war or something yeah. like that. But I'm saying versus sort of the mortgage slave lifestyle that so that I'm used to really that I thought was just par for the course. I feel very secure in yeah. this, this new lifestyle. Well, it's wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing it all with us today. Uh, Baby probably needs to be fed sometime soon. <laughs> Thanks again. Where can people find more of you? Demir yeah. and Carrie Bentley. Demir and Carrie Bentley. You can check us out at www.lifehackbootcamp.com. That's where we have a lot of our stuff. You could also, if you're a YouTuber, check us out on YouTube. We have the Lifehack Bootcamp channel where we do a lot of videos about our lifestyle and hacks and tips and tricks. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. This was so much fun. Dude, thank you. I hope that conversation with Demir and Carrie Bentley gave you some ideas and inspiration for how you might redesign your life. Thank you for mentioning Love Your Work and the Heart to Start on social media. Thank you to Hello Boss Girl, Boss Girl Breakthroughs Group on Facebook for naming Love Your Work in their top 19 podcasts of 2019, we were number seven. That's amazing. And there's some pretty impressive uh, names on there. I'm not going to name names. You have to go check it out. And on Twitter, thank you to Priya at Winter Knit. Thank you to Stefan Heineken. 
Thank you to Sarah Tarikani. Thank you to Jovian Guatama. And on Instagram, thank you to AMR Asaid. I think that's maybe Amir Asaid who shared a nice story with a summary from an episode. And the update of the month goes to Motherhood and Merlot on Instagram who shared in a story. I don't actually remember where exactly I said this, but it was a nice quote. You don't need the largest possible audience to be successful. You need the smallest audience that will support you unconditionally. And then you need to blow them away. Hashtag 2020. Apparently I said that at some point. And uh, thank you for being that smallest audience that will support you unconditionally, who's listening all the way to the end of the podcast. I really appreciate you listening. And I also appreciate the support of you who are supporting financially as well. How do you feel on Monday morning? Are you geared up and excited about the week ahead? Or are you struggling to get started? Either way, how would you like to start off your week with a dose of inspiration? I've collected more than 15,000 highlights studying the lives of history's greatest creators. And each Monday in my Love Mondays newsletter, I share the very best nuggets of wisdom I've found. Sign up at kdv.co slash Mondays. That's kdv.co slash Mondays. At the core of being able to love your work is one question. Where does the money come from? Does the work you do make humanity better? Do the products you use help you grow as a person? That's why supporting Love Your Work on Patreon is good for all of us. I can focus on making a great show so you can become a better human. It's an honest exchange, value for value. This show costs hundreds of dollars a month to produce and bring to your ears. I invest my time and creative energy in making it, so I can't keep this show going without your support. Please support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash cadavy. Think of it like a coffee meeting. Is this show worth buying me a coffee a month? Head to patreon.com slash cadavy to join. You'll get perks such as early access to ad-free content, master classes, or office hours directly with me. That's patreon.com slash cadavy. Or Overcast users, just tap on the dollar sign. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our top Patreon supporters, such as Jeffrey Mason. The theme music for Love Your Work is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs> <laughs>